the start of the year, you were very much in the driver's seat. But what happens as the housing market starts to change? Supply will likely remain tight for a while and boost home price inflation. That's the biggest annual price increase in more than seven years. Home prices just keep rising across the U.S. But I still feel kind of worried to actually be worth how much I'm paying for it. Hi guys, welcome back to our channel. If you're new here, my name's Ashton, and when I'm not exploring Germany and the Black Forest with my husband Jonathan and our son Jack, I'm a published researcher and an academic in the housing sector. Over the next few weeks, I'll explore subjects related to housing, from zoning laws to housing affordability, public housing to private construction. We're going to be taking a hard look at the American dream, all the while looking abroad to models in other countries that could serve as an example for how we could create a more equitable housing market. So in today's video, we're gonna start off the series with a subject that is incredibly relevant right now, and that's the affordable housing crisis. In fact, right now in the United States, record-breaking numbers of Americans are struggling to afford a place to call home. Nationally, there's a shortage of more than 7 million affordable homes for America's 10.8 million plus extremely low income families. There is no state or county where a renter working full time at minimum wage can afford a two bedroom apartment. And guys, this isn't a blue or red issue. Every single one of the 50 states struggles with affordable housing. Each year, the shortage gets worse and couple this gap with record setting inflation. There's no wonder why half a million people are homeless in the United States and why working families struggle to pay for groceries and to visit their doctor. But I think I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself here. So let's jump right into this video by starting at the beginning of the story. As an American, I think we're finally getting to a place of a broader awareness of housing shortages. And part of that has to do with the fact that housing in America is getting a lot more expensive. People who live in big expensive coastal cities like Boston, New York, and cities in California, they've been talking about this for at least 20 years now. But it's maybe only in the last five years or so that this has really become part of the national dialogue. To be quite honest, the pandemic really put America in kind of a perfect storm scenario. On the one hand, Americans kind of went on a buying spree. With work from home becoming more attractive and widely accepted, Americans were looking to size up for bigger homes with bigger yards. In fact, home sales last year in 2021 were at the highest level since 2006. However, at the same time, many Americans were also not as willing to sell, arguably because the pandemic had some homeowners weary of the market and job security. So at the end of April 2021, there was a record low of homes in the market, only 1.16 million houses for sale, down 20.5% from the year before. Couple these factors with record-setting inflation, home prices are up 20% just from last year making the average price for a house in the United States the highest it has ever been. And because we just simply aren't building at the rate that we should to be able to keep up with these numbers, America really is facing a housing shortage. And from my perspective, one of the things that I think makes America so unique is that the house building business in the United States is really one of the last vestiges of small business enterprises. Now, don't get me wrong, there are still a lot of large publicly traded companies that are in the business of building single family and multifamily housing in the United States, such as Lennar, Beezer Homes, NVR, and Hovanian Enterprises. But the vast majority of housing in the United States is actually built by small businesses. In fact, according to the National Association of Home Builders, close to 80% of home builders and specially trade contractor firms are actually self-employed, independent businesses. Now, in the construction industry, contractors will often talk about the three L's, lumber, labor, and land, all of which became much harder to find during the pandemic. Pretty much internationally, builders are facing supply chain shortages due to the pandemic, and it's ultimately increasing the costs of materials. 
As of May 2021, lumber prices are up more than 300% from the year prior, according to, again, the National Association of Home Builders. But I don't want to silo the rising cost of housing solely on the supply chain or the pandemic. Like many systematic issues in the United States, issues in one sector are often related to political or economic issues in another. For example, in the United States, an aging workforce and challenging immigration policies have led to a shortage of construction workers. And if you caught our video on the decline of vocational education in the United States, you are also familiar with the fact that the U.S. education system is moving away from encouraging young adults from trade and vocational education in favor of university degrees. And because of the shortage of skilled workers, the prices for labor are going through the roof. But what might be an even bigger issue in regards to the increasing housing costs is relative to the very land that they're built on. As of April 2021, the price for a single lot is up 11% compared to last year. And real estate data firm Zonda said that new land supply is going down 24% from a year ago. So many researchers in my field will often talk about issues of infill in the United States. With suburban sprawl being a defining feature of the American landscape since the Second World War, the real challenge is trying to figure out how to get the industry and the buyers to reinvest in cities and older suburbs. In other words, how do we take a play from the international housing playbook in order to encourage revitalization of our cities and gain higher density? And ultimately, how can we use these tools to champion for people who are in desperate need of affordable housing in our own communities. Hi guys, I hope you're enjoying this video. In particular, the new to our channel, Whiteboard Motion Graphics. I've shared for a couple of months now that I've been busy behind the scenes trying to become a better filmmaker, a better storyteller. And the introduction of graphics that visually help me to tell our story is a huge piece of that puzzle. So I think now is a good time to introduce you to the sponsor of today's video, which is Skillshare. So all of those fancy little graphics that you've seen sprinkled throughout this video, yeah, I've made them myself on a program called VideoScribe, thanks to the one hour course on Skillshare called Animated Whiteboard Explainer Videos by John Davis, an online content creator who teaches others how to up their game with social media platforms and digital marketing skills. So obviously it was awesome to take a class from someone who is an expert in their field. But I also loved that it was ad free so I could stay in the zone while I was exploring how to create animations, learning how to navigate the interface with audio and timing, and really learn how to harness the power of the software's motion graphics tools. And again, up until this point, I'd like to think that our videos are educational, but I also wanted to bring in more infotainment style content as well making them not only informational, but also visually appealing. And thanks to my membership with Skillshare, I have unlimited access to an online learning community with thousands of inspiring classes for anyone who loves learning and wants to explore their creativity and learn new skills. So if you're ready to learn a new skill, definitely head over to Skillshare by clicking the first link down below in the description of this video. Because they're sponsoring our video today, I can actually give you your first month completely for free. So yeah, just click the link down below to join. I really look forward to introducing in better graphics, better editing into our channel in the future. And ultimately, I hope you guys enjoy the final product. So let's get back to the video. All right, now I very well understand that there are some pretty significant differences in the government style between the United States and Germany. But if you look at all international governments on a continuum, there actually is quite a bit of overlap between the US and Germany. Germany governs itself similarly to the United States through a decentralized system that corresponds to the states, provinces, counties, regional districts, and cities. Granted, Germany is not as decentralized as the US overall, but it is similar to the US's most populous jurisdictions when it comes to land use planning. For example, major US cities will all have land use planning systems where localities are expected to harmonize their plans with those of higher levels of government through a process of review and consultation. But Germany stands out in the housing sector for a couple of pretty big reasons. And the first is that its housing prices are actually uncannily, ridiculously stable. Residential prices in Germany have changed little over the last 50 years. 
straight through German reunification, European Union expansion, and the 2008 global financial crisis, German home prices have generally stayed the same. And yes, if you're from cities like Berlin or Munich or right here in Freiburg, I can imagine that you're furiously typing on your keyboard right now telling me about how expensive housing is. And you're not wrong, but hear me out. Relative price aside, by comparison, German housing prices really are quite stable. In fact, from the graphic you see on your screen, Germany's housing economy is the most stable in the world, only outrivaled by Japan. And yes, I do know that housing prices have been rising recently. If you saw on that graph, there is a little uptick there at the end, and I just bought a house in Germany, so I feel the pain. But that uptick isn't necessarily unique to Germany. Inflation is happening globally. And again, Germany isn't immune. Much like the US, Germany has suffered a shortage of construction labor. And while its urban population has grown quickly, as young Germans, immigrants from other places in the Eurozone, and refugees from abroad have flocked to cities, Germany too has fallen behind in its own home building goals. Like home prices, rents in new buildings have climbed more and more in the past decade than in previous ones. But again, if we look at this data, you can see that despite record levels of inflation, the cost of housing has still not risen to the levels in the United States. And there are a couple of reasons for its stability. One of the big ones is that Germany, quite frankly, just really encourages home building. Lots of it. Germany is a juggernaut of adding apartments, row houses, and other homes, and often mixing them together when creating new developments. In fact, the very neighborhood that we just bought our house in is a prime example of this, with lots of different styles of housing from apartments all the way up to single family homes in the same neighborhood. Additionally, from 2010 to 2019, for every 100 people added to Germany's population, the country gave permits for construction of 97 homes. That's right, Germany almost added just as many homes as it did people. So let's circle back to the United States and see how things have been done there. There's actually a really fascinating study done by Alan During from the Sightline Institute. And he found that in the same period, for every 100 additional people living in the five Cascadian states, which is Alaska, Idaho, Montana, Oregon, and Washington, the region awarded permits for the construction of just 42 new homes. One new home for every 2.4 extra people. So adjusted for population growth, Germany actually added nearly twice as many new homes as Cascadia during the exact same period. Perhaps one of the biggest lessons that America can learn from Germany in order to construct more affordable housing is how to properly encourage more home building within the city limits in order to make the population more dense and more socioeconomically diverse. To be clear, Germany doesn't mandate that its cities build new houses. Instead, they use the carrot on the stick method. In other words, they incentivize their cities to build new homes by tethering how many residents the cities have directly to the revenue it gets. Germany's century-old system of fiscal equalization among the federal states gives local municipalities a stake in providing abundant housing. The system generally works by distributing state funds according to a formula in which population is the main factor. Most municipalities get more than a quarter of their funds from equalization grants, and many of their other revenues also grow directly with population size. For example, heavily populated localities get a bigger share of their state's 19% value-added tax than less populous ones. Now, for our American viewers, value-added tax, or VAT, is somewhat similar to sales tax that you would experience in the United States. But where in the U.S. sales tax will vary from state to state, county to county, city to city, in Germany it is fixed countrywide. Local German officials, pretty much like local leaders everywhere, seek bigger budgets to provide more and better service to their constituents. But what is very different about Germany is that if a city wants to increase its budget, the best way to do that is by increasing its local population. So resultantly in Germany, you have a system that is practically the opposite 
of what is termed fiscal zoning, which is what they use in the United States. This is again used in the United States as a way of zoning land to increase a municipal's income while minimizing their costs. You see, in municipalities with high sales taxes, such as Tacoma, Washington, leaders zone more land for shopping centers because again, their income is tied to sales taxes. But in places where residential property taxes are capped, such as California, they're going to zone less land for homes and more for offices. And in affluent suburbs where they already have high income due to property taxes, they often zone land for houses on large lots, thereby excluding low-income people. One of the great theorists on what's going on in the United States is a Dartmouth economist named William Fischel. He wrote about what he calls the home voter hypothesis, which holds that local governments are almost single-mindedly focused on maximizing real estate values because homeowners typically vote their home values in local elections. But by contrast, German jurisdictions gain financially by increasing population, not house value, because renters actually outnumber homeowners in this country. Homeowning voters just quite frankly aren't the dominant electoral force. Renters are. And it doesn't matter so much whether or not that renter rents an expensive apartment or an affordable apartment. Population is population. But here's the thing, density alone really isn't the silver bullet to solving America's affordable housing crisis. So here again, we can actually look to Germany for a couple of recommendations on how to fix affordable housing. Because here, our cities aren't just more dense, they're also a lot more architecturally diverse. Private landlords are an important pillar in the German rental housing market. More than half of landlords are non-professional owners, such as individuals, trusts, or homeowners associations. And also unlike the United States, households in Germany are actually incentivized to rent out their privately owned homes. First, mortgage interest in Germany is only deductible from one's income taxes when the home is rented out. Second, transaction costs for home purchases are high by international standards, making home purchases extremely costly upfront. And again, because the rental housing market is dominated by non-professional owners, you aren't going to see these like mega complexes of rental apartments, at least not to the same degree as you see in the United States, such as this mega apartment complex in Granville, Michigan, that was actually built to look like Germany's new Schwanstein castle. Oh no, God! No, God, please, no! 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 Yeah, oh my God, I'm so sorry. In fact, guys, most Germans actually live in multifamily buildings with up to 10 apartments, regardless of whether or not you rent that apartment or own that apartment. Roughly one quarter of Germans live in large housing blocks or high rise buildings, and only a third live in single family homes. The rest all fall somewhere in the middle. And because of these factors, Germany actually managed to create a well-functioning, relatively affordable and high quality rental market. In contrast to the United States, the German state provided generous subsidies to both forms of tenure from renters and homeowners, often empowering regional governments to decide how to distribute those funds. So one of the recommendations that's often suggested by political economists is that the US could actually begin to implement reasonable subsidies to both renters and homeowners alike while still giving local communities some sensitivity for how to address housing in their own jurisdictions. And this could actually be a pretty cool way to encourage affordable housing around the country. So if you caught our video on the differences between American houses and German houses, one of the things that we talked about is that Germans are just far more likely to rent than own, where in the United States, the opposite is true. And largely that's due to the prevailing political economic theory in the United States that home ownership 
is the quote unquote ideal method for building wealth with the added benefit of making neighborhoods safer for families and better schools for children. I mean, quite frankly, a lot of the American psychology around home buying centers around this idea that if I move into a neighborhood where all of the other houses look like mine, then the people who bought those houses must also look like me and be good people like me. And whether or not you actually subscribe to that theory, it really does color a lot of the American laws and regulations that really prioritize home ownership. Housing is an essential part of the US growth model based on consumption and finance with the important transmission effects into the larger economy. By contrast, the German economic model is largely based on exports and savings and much less dependent on housing. So when you talk to Americans or listen to debates in the United States, they're often centered around the effects of reform on housing demand, mortgage rates, house prices, and consumption. These considerations are all the more important as many Americans use their home as a form of private social insurance. In other words, for most Americans, their home is their safety net. It's their retirement plan. It's their savings account. But contrary to the United States, these factors are rarely mentioned in German political debates because home ownership policies are not really tied in closely with the country's growth model. Instead, policymakers view housing policy as a means to achieve family, urban development, or asset-based welfare priorities, and of course, affordable housing. And ultimately, guys, the economic models of both countries are an incredibly important part of the equation when it comes to policymaking in the housing arena. All right, guys, so in today's video, we talked a lot about housing affordability, and part of that conversation included multifamily housing. And probably the most commonly talked about strategy that lawmakers can do to help encourage more multifamily housing is to make changes to zoning laws, specifically single family exclusionary zoning. But is it the magic solution that a lot of lawmakers would lead us to believe? On next week's episode, we're gonna be taking a deep dive into American zoning regulations, taking a look at the topics like the history of redlining, nimbyism, and how the term zoning is actually shorthand for a much, much larger set of issues. So guys, before I let you go, I would love to hear from you down in the comment section. What barriers do you see are one of the hurdles in your area to gaining more affordable housing? And what strategies do you think that America could employ to help make its housing stock more affordable? Please let me know down in the comments section below. And if you enjoyed today's video, be sure to hit that thumbs up button. And for more content, including other episodes in this series, be sure to hit that subscribe button and the notification bell for when the next episode goes live. I'm really looking forward to continuing the series and I'll see you guys next Sunday. Cheers.